everyone. Welcome on into OneSoccer.ca. Andy Petrillo, Laura Armstrong, Kaylin Kyle, the three amigos. We, as per usual, are always with you. We're so pleased to have on our show today, Melissa Tank Credit, two-time Olympic bronze medalist. And yes, someone who's still doing great work in soccer. We're going to dive into that in just a moment. But Tank, can I call you Tank? Because I feel like I've called Absolutely. you that. And I have admired yeah. your game for so long. <laughs> I'm so excited that you're on the show today and the fact that it's also International Women's Day. So happy International Women's Day to my beautiful co-workers here. And I, I guess I want to start with you, Melissa, just what this day means to you. Yeah, I think, I mean, this morning just topped it off. I had a, another engagement this morning and just, I feel like for me, it's it's celebrating Obviously, where we've come in this world, in the workforce, I just did an engagement with the tech team and just seeing the amount of females in, or the amount of women in tech as well, uh, celebrating that part of it, but also having the deeper conversations. Where can we take it to the next level? You know, there's a lot more to do. Um, how can we get innovative ab about bringing more women into, I mean, the workforce and, and my workforce as well, uh, in the game? Um, there, there's a lot to talk about, but as same time not forgetting that we need to celebrate the fact that we're pretty badass <laughs> <laughs> so true Kaylin what about you what does this day mean to you yeah I am just going off what Melissa said I think you look at that 2012 team and every time we're texting one another it's always like did you see what Ree did did you see what Carm's doing you see what Mel's doing it's just like a very special team in and around there so I'm delighted to be part of it and obviously now in the broadcast world to just bring light to these players and Obviously, Melissa, you're doing such wonderful things uh, with the national team. And then obviously you didn't even mention opening your own chiropractor clinic, which is <laughs> insane to me. So mm -hmm. you literally will wear a million and two hats. So I'm just grateful to not only be your friend, but your old roommate, your chick eating I partner, your wine drinking partner. But I'm just happy <laughs> to have you on the show because you were one of my idols growing up, you, Carm and Sinclair. So yeah, it's just uh, it's a cool moment to have you back. Thanks, Kay. I feel like we're gonna have to dive more into this. A little. No, like, who, who can share <laughs> whose secrets here? Because no. I think this show just kind of got derailed a little bit. But I love that 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 you know when, and I guess that's a special bond. Obviously, as athletes being on the same team, and and when you travel the world together, and then obviously when you accomplish something fantastic together at the Olympics. I mean, do you find you know Melissa that you do keep tabs on on one another and kind of celebrate each other's achievements? It's pretty crazy to know that every month there's something new that somebody else is doing that's even better than the last, you know, like we have a, I, I knew that team was special to be honest and to see where everyone's at right now. And I mean, even if I'm not talking to them every single day, I'm just, just smiling at home. Like this is incredible. Like watching Kaylin on, on television, like that's incredible who she's speaking to and like really digging her, her name into that, into that brand basically. Um, it's, I mean, Karina, Carm, Rian, Brittany Timko, Emily Zur, like, if you look at the whole team, I mean, I can't forget Selenia, business partner. Um, but <laughs> she's holding up what everyone behind doing, you right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty incredible, and I I knew I knew that team was special, but to see it come alive in in the world today and and how everyone's changing their little corners, it's it's pretty insane to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. And by the way, Andy, I've actually just texted Melissa before this to be like, say all these good things about me. Yeah, hundred so. <laughs> percent. With an e transfer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to say that transfer is uh, hit send now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Laura, what does this uh, what does this day mean to you as as a woman in in the field of writing who's been in just about you know a lot of every press box out there? Um, you know, what does this day mean to you? I mean, first of all, for giving flowers for women in media, Andy's basically an institution. So we need to, I mean, I don't know. Do you like being called an institution? I'm not sure. But, like, I mean, I think that, I mean, I was, I, I got a chance to write about a number of inspiring women. Andy was on the list and she wasn't on the list because we worked together and I was like trying to suck up to her. She was on the list because when I pulled so many people, they were like, Andy Petrillo, when I am thinking about women in media, yeah. this is who I'm thinking about. She left Leafs lunch this year and suddenly is everywhere else, you know? So it's pretty incredible. Um, but this, this day means a lot to me. I think it's a really great day in terms of, you know, all the feels you get to see a lot of things being promoted a lot of deals coming out i mean you think like espn today re-signed doris burke great everybody mm. feels very excited about that but i also really feel like 
I kind of wish we didn't have to have an International Women's Day. You know, I wish we didn't have to have this one day a year where we celebrated women. I wish this was something that we, you know, could do every single day. And I hope that every year, I just hope that there are more days next year where we celebrate women um, than there were the last, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to be something that as we see strides in all industries, like I love that Melissa mentioned the tech industry. It's not just sports. We focus on sports because that's our industry that we work in, but women are making strides everywhere. Um, and, and let's just like continue that to the point where International Women's Day is just like, you know, 365 days a year. So yeah. Yeah. Well said, well said by you. Thank you for your kind words. Although you've kind of just described me as a cockroach. I'm just, I, it's, hard to kill me. it's hard to get rid of me. It's hard to kill me. That's basically what we've concluded. But you know what? You're right on that. And I say this all the time. Um, I find a lot of things and it's so great, you know, that we celebrate women on International Women's Day. And a lot of, again, to your point, we speak of sports organizations, they'll do things, right? The all female broadcast, the all women this. Is that a token move or is that a stepping stone move, right? Like to me, I always ask that question. Make sure that it's a stepping stone and it's not a token because a token tells me that it is just the one day and then we kind of forget about it, yeah. right? So, uh, but we are seeing so much um, movement. We're seeing, you know, evolution. We're seeing change right down to women, our owners and executives in a lot of, you know, for, you know NBA, NFL. Uh, it's already announced Emily Castingay, right? She's an assistant general manager now in the NHL with the Vancouver Canucks. We've seen also women yeah. GMs in MLB. Uh, Angela James is part of an ownership group that just purchased the Toronto Six in the, uh, yes, Premier Hockey Federation. So it's fantastic to also just have Canadians own the one Canadian team that's in that league. Uh, what do you what do you make of this, Kaylin, as well? That, you know, it's we, we love that phrase because it's so true. If you see it, you can be it. But what about the people who are behind the scenes? How important is it as well to elevate the execs, you know, right? the GMs, the owners, the scouts, um, you know, people who are in those, women who are in those types of positions too? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. You look at the Toronto Six, I've been lucky enough to follow that team and that league. I've been on some of the calls as well, but you're starting to see more females get put into a role and it genuinely changes the mentality in and around these organizations. I mean, you see it within the NWSL now, thank God. Um, you're starting to see it in, I mean, you just touched on a lot of the different leagues and I think it's so incredibly important that there was a first, and it's the little things as well in Charlotte, uh, the new MLS expansion team there, they mm -hmm. had an all female photography, videography. Um, there was like nine of them and no males included in that. And the, the content that they put out is amazing. So the more females you put into these roles, it just opens up opportunity for other females because it's like, yeah, we can do the exact same work, if not even better. I mean, even in the industry that we're in, I mean, three females in the broadcasting world, it's very difficult. Melissa and chiropractor, it's very unheard of to see a female own her own practice. And I mean, no disrespect for it, but we have to start making that normal and normalize it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the women like us putting in the work and breaking down those barriers and breaking down, down those glass ceilings. Because if we're not doing the work, we're only setting us back five, 10 years and, and people just coasting by in this industry. And again, really lucky to be on this with you guys today, especially today, because I think we're the last three that coast by anything, um, the last four, excuse me. So um, yeah, I think it's really, really important. And we're starting to see that shift and it's not just the token. I mean, the broadcast as well, just more women in broadcast, which mm -hmm. I think is so important. I mean, you look at the uh, the Canadian men's national team now, Robin Gale in there. I mean, I was pitch side watching her work her magic. I'm like, this is amazing, but this should be normalized because we are extremely good at what we do and we're so hardworking and we're so driven. So yeah, I think we're starting to slowly see the change. It's not happening again overnight, but mm -hmm. the right people in the right jobs is definitely going to open up more doors and more opportunities. Yeah. And I mean, to go back to you, Melissa as well. So head chiropractor for, you know, the women's team. And I, I know a lot of, you know, players, you don't know where to go afterwards as well, right? It was either maybe you go into, you know, broadcasting or wait a second, what if I want to coach or what if I want to do analytics or what if I, anything else sometimes that can be behind, you know, the scenes. Did you find there was any kind of pushback at all? Or, you know, what was that like to get that door open for you to get into that type of position and, and prove to other, you know, young women out there that these are positions that are still available to you as well. I'm just curious your experience and how you got into that role once your playing days were done. Yeah, I think even in my school days in St. Louis, I remember talking to the head of athletic therapists of the NHL uh, through my agent. And 
I remember him saying very directly that there will be no females in the hockey game. There's no chance. You can't, you can't be in, you can't be in the locker room. And uh, I found that like, that's impossible, but here we are. I think it was like this year that was the first person, I think the first AT that's on the bench for an NHL team, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But like even hearing that, and I mean, that was in 2006 and we're in 2020, 22 now. Right. So, I mean, Already, there was exactly what Caitlin was saying. Glass ceilings, you know, people were putting here. You can have this potential here, but you can't go beyond it because you know it's unheard of. And, and for the national team, it was unheard of. And yeah. it wasn't until, you know, I was kind of just probing a little bit as a medical staff, like I want to be a part of the medical staff, and and having someone basically um, stand in my corner and and take a risk with me and bring me on board. I mean, it takes that opportunity, obviously, to keep the door open. Um, but then once that door is open, I think now that you see. Robin Gale, a part of the men's team. You see uh, Jasmine Mander, an analyst with our team. Like, there's different roles that you can fill, and I think the opportunity is endless. You just need one. You need someone brave enough to take that chance yeah. and risk on you, and and two to be able to kind of ba- basically back it up. Like, I, I know what I'm worth, and I know that I can fill this role and do it in a very good way. And obviously, I've having Bev now on board, and she believes fully in my abilities, and I feel like the the limit is endless for me right now. That's pretty incredible. I mean, I, oh, and it's just, but it's also so infuriating. I mean, 2006 really isn't that long ago. And to hear that somebody said that, you're just like, really, that's your mentality? Because that's what we're trying to break down. And it's taking this long uh, to break that down. And in particular, in the world of sport, Laura, I mean, as somebody who also has been in press boxes and I've been, you know, um, in scrums, and I know a lot of the writers, you know, are men. And I'm just wondering, you know, what your experience has been like when you've walked into a lot of these places and, you know, and just how you've been treated. Yeah. I mean, listen, I've been treated very well. I feel very lucky to be able to say that because I know that that is not the case for every woman. And I feel like uh, particularly the previous generation of, of reporters who, who really fought to be in those rooms in the first place, um, they certainly didn't have the same experience as I have had. So um, I, I certainly think that um, you, you definitely, you definitely, realize it right there there are times where and you go about your day to day and you're thinking okay well this is my day i'm gonna go in i'm gonna do my job and then i'm gonna go home that's how i sort of approach my day and it doesn't because you're surrounded by so many you know men mostly all of the time i don't really think it it it, i always take a second to realize like oh right now you know in this baseball locker room for example there are four of us women and there are 25 men right like you just you don't you don't think about that necessarily because you're just trying to do your job. Um, but when you take a step back, you really do realize um, the difference, right? And and um, and four women in a, in a baseball pre- press box is a lot, right? Like that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big number. Um, so I think it, it's definitely something um, that I wouldn't necessarily say always affects my day to day. But when you do look at the bigger picture, and then you think about what Melissa just said, though, I think 2006, now we're 2022. 2022, And Andy, like, it wasn't that long ago. And there has been a shift in mentality. I mean, it's taken a long time. And it, it sort of feels like it's so slow going. And then suddenly, but if you look at that next period of 15 years or so, and you think like, what what can what strides can we make going forward? What can we do next? How, what's going to be the change when you know somebody else is having these conversations, or maybe they don't even have to have these conversations fifteen mm-hmm. years from now? That would be phenomenal. So it's definitely um, a changing industry, and I think like going back to the initial question, Andy, about having execs and people in really every different area of sports it's about pathways. Like, I feel like if I had a shot for every time I said pathways on the show, then I would be drunk all the time. But like, <laughs> I think that, that's important. And you think about the Raptors and you think about like the Raptors organizations, one that stands out to me, they have so many women and they talk, Masai Ujiri mm. talks about how there's value in perspective, perspective, different perspectives are a competitive yeah. advantage. And that's what you talk about for any kind of diversity. And that's why you have to create pathways to make sure that we're getting different people uh, you know, no matter gender, no matter race, whatever the case may be, into different positions where you're going to make an organization thrive because a lot of people uh, think differently based on the way they were raised or based on yeah. the situations yeah. that they've experienced. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of thriving, that is something that you have done, Melissa. I mean, you have a very storied <laughs> career. 
people can look at that, you know, you know, competing on the international level for so many years for Canada. And, and I mentioned the Olympic medals as well that you brought home. And now even once your career is done, you've created this whole other career, which is really special and, you know, head chiropractor for the women's team and obviously having your own practice. And I, I always wonder, you know, as, as a fan, we can watch and say, oh, I thought that was your best game or I thought that was the most incredible goal that you scored or that was your great assist there and, you know, at the Olympics, all this kind of stuff, right, that we can go into. But is there something uh, about your career that you're most proud of that we just wouldn't know? I remember asking Christine Sinclair something like this, and I thought for sure it had to have been that hat trick, you know, in 2012. And then she went on to talk about some obscure goal that she scored <laughs> like years earlier in Brazil at some obscure tournament. I'm like, huh? <laughs> and she's like that was my favorite goal. It was just, but it was so eye-opening to me because what matters to us doesn't always resonate, you know, with you. But I'm just, I'm curious if there's something in your career that you're really proud of that we don't know about. Yeah, I think for me, it's more of a um, more of a window of time. I don't know many people probably didn't know this about me, but after London, I was basically forced to leave soccer and forced, but I had to go back to finish my my career, my chiropractic, basically college. Um, and I had two and a half years left. So I left soccer for two and a half years uh, and then tried to come back after two and a half years away for the 2015 World Cup. And I mean, that World Cup was a disaster for me. Like I knew I wasn't anywhere near that where I used to be. I mean, Kaylin was there. I was tearing my calf and blowing my back out, putting my cleats back on, you know, for, for training games. And um, for me to get to that World Cup wasn't really where I wanted to be. And I, I wanted to, maybe I was like, maybe I should retire. I mean, I was so embarrassed by my performance, but it was that time, I would say the nine months between 2015 and, and making that team in Rio, because John basically didn't give me a spot. He basically told me, I don't see you on the team. Yeah. And it was basically nine months of me working my butt off to prove him wrong. That's how I'm driven. He's a very smart man, but yeah. prove him wrong and, and make that roster and to come out the day before that game against Australia and, and he gave me a starting position and, and basically I was supposed to play a full 90 um, for him to give me that and, and give me that shirt. That was my moment for me. I think that's probably my most proud moment in my career. I honestly I went from the lowest of lows, killed a relationship, so much negative talk to being able to be part of that second bronze medal and personally be proud of what performance I put on the field as a 34 year old. Um, and I think that was it for me. No, I mean, cause that's, that's your comeback, right? That's you basically that's having to dig in and, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Kaylin, as my dog once again attacks the, um, poor male guy here. <laughs> so what, what memory do you even have of Melissa as a teammate that stands oh. out to you? I mean, for me, I have two really important ones. The first one, obviously, when I moved to Vancouver, not a lot of people know this. I went, God, I think I was like 13 or 14. I was so young and I'd move over in the summers. And I remember we had this basement suite. It was me, Melissa. She's laughing because she knows exactly what I'm going to say. And Katie Thorlickson. It was a three bedroom, two bath. I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. It was infested with rats. But because it was like... It, it was like, oh, every, gross. it was like two o'clock in the morning and we'd hear like scratching and I'd be like, True. Go to Melissa's room. Cause I, she was like my, my mom. I didn't have my parents there. I didn't have a sister. I didn't have anyone I knew family or anything. Melissa was like my team mom that kept me on track. I remember I was training with the U20 team and the, the full team. And we were doing like four sessions a day. Like it was insane. I had lost so much weight. I like wasn't eating. I didn't know about proper nutrition. I remember I was eating at this like little subway place because I didn't know how to cook. And Melissa was like, are you okay? And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, you literally look like you're about to like decombust, like <laughs> your skin and bone. She had like called my mom and flew like, was like, Pat, you need to come out here. Like Kaylin, like, and it was because I, I was getting overworked in a situation where I was between two teams. And it was that turning point where I was like, wow, someone had my back off the field and she didn't know anything about me. I literally got moved into this house. They probably didn't want this young player even living there and kind of took me under her wing. So that was like my first moment of Melissa where I was like, okay, like I am going to be your best friend, whether you like it or not forever, like you're stuck with me. Um, and then there's like off field antics where, I mean, we won't air those on TV because no one wants to hear about that. I was no longer the mom. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's just put this. She was no longer the mom. She was more of the best friend. Um, and then, my second one, I remember it was against Sweden actually. And it was like, it was like Melissa got this look in her eyes and was like, 
I am taking this team through this game because I am getting us into that semifinal. And I just remember seeing, I think it was the game too, where you had the wrap around your head. Like she was literally like, if you haven't seen the images, we got to pull one up. I'm going to ask the producer to, to oh, okay. put it in here because it, it was just like a woman possessed in the best way possible and literally got us into that semifinal uh, versus uh, the, I think it was the Americans or maybe GB. I don't know, got us to the next game. And it was like, this woman can literally do everything. So, I mean, I have so many moments. If we had like a two hour show here today, it would be like stories about <laughs> Melissa and like <laughs> Kaylin, like fangirling over her. But yeah, no, I just, I think you'd like the world of you, obviously. But yeah, there's, there's always a lot of moments with her. Like when people touch on Christine Sinclair, I, and again, no disrespect, Christine Sinclair is Christine Sinclair, but I always touch on Melissa Tank Reddy. And it was like when Sinky wasn't stepping up, Mel was always stepping up for us and putting the ball into the back of the net or leading off the pitch. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I love I it. I feel like that's so. like sort of the fan, like, sorry, speaking as a fan, if we're going to talk fangirls, <laughs> um, like uh, speaking the fan experience, like that is how like fans of a certain age thought of Melissa, right? Like, I mean, I remember, I can tell you exactly where I was <laughs> when uh, I was watching that 2002, like under 19 world champion. In Edmonton. Like I was like a very, yeah, like I can, I wasn't in Edmonton. I was sitting at my grandma's house. Um, <laughs> but like, I can tell you exactly where I was. And I have jerseys. Like I, I was like a fan girl when I was a kid of this, like the women's national team. And I feel like that was even before we we had this sort of tagline of, of if you can see it, you can be it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there were just, you know, women who were doing it. And when I think back to women that I idolize, Melissa was absolutely one of them because, you know, she was she was out there and she was doing it and she was killing it. And it was, you know, it, it meant a lot. I mean, I was never going to be it. There was literally no <laughs> chance of that. <laughs> it definitely, um, it definitely makes you like think. Oh, maybe there's another area for me um, where I can be involved in this game that I love mm -hmm. um, going forward, even if I can't, you know, put a ball in the back of a net. Mm -hmm. right. Laura, we think you can do it. No, nope. nope. my, <laughs> my dad was my coach as a child, and even he is like, nope, nope. No. <laughs> oh. not even dad put you into the starting eleven. Um, <laughs> But it is, it is true, and, and I would like to add to that and kind of put a bow on it, because I think this is why it is so important to also elevate women in sport, because you're not just encouraging and inspiring a little girl to be an athlete herself, yeah. mm -hmm. but you're also inspiring them to just get into the world of sport, you know, whatever category that is in, which is why it's also so great when you see, Kaylin, you know, you've retired from the game, but now you've found this another path where you're still in sport, in broadcasting. Melissa, you've retired from the game, but you're still on this other path in sport, in, you know, in, chiro in, in your chiropractor work. Like, it's just, it's all this stuff where you're like, okay, there's so many influences that you can have uh, across the board. And but think, just jumping in quick, Andy, there, and I think it's important, though, that we, we keep having players and former players retire, but still stay in the mm -hmm. sport. Because we yeah. touched on what makes these organizations successful, putting people in the right positions. And it's actually people that have played the game, that have been in those difficult situations. And again, it's not taking anything away from, you know, someone like yourself, Laura. I know you're one of the hardest working people. Same with you, Andy. But if we can have a balance of that and a mix of that, of former professionals that have been there, that have gone through the worst of the worst, the best of the best, and just being able to add some of that vision and inspire, again, not even a younger generation, but just people in that workforce. I mean, I've gone into organizations where I'm like, this is not a team at all. And this should be a team, you know, whether it's production, whether it's, you know, the janitor cleaning the bathroom, like treating everyone as an equal. So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that we definitely learned of like going through some of the worst times as an athlete. I mean, Melissa, you touched on it being, you know, having to take two and a half years off to us living and moving to Italy. And that's an, again for another show, but I, I think it's so important that there is people retiring from the national team and staying in sport. Mm -hmm. it also doesn't, that, that staying in sport is so important. Yeah. And I think that that doesn't matter if it's like you're even working towards a, uh, a, a like working towards a career in sports, right? If you think about, I mean, let's read all the reports about what it means for girls to stay in sports, right? And for them to learn the, 
the the skills that come from being part of a team or being part of 100%. an athletic career, right? Yeah. And that's like a big, big thing. We're seeing young girls drop out of sports far too soon because there's nowhere mm -hmm. for them to go or they don't feel accepted or whatever the case, body dysmorphia, like all of these things that you don't even consider. And it's like, you learn diligence, you learn teamwork, you learn, you know, how to navigate highs and lows. And all of these things are important. So it doesn't necessarily have to lead to like, uh, a future in sports it might just be a future in a beer league but it really mm. does mean something I mean that now <laughs> <laughs> beer leagues are fun there's a lot <laughs> less pressure yeah than you bring here. and a lot a lot more toe punting the ground and falling <laughs> yeah ass over tea kettle um so i want to end with this because here's the other I guess what's well, a challenge still, right? And and I mean, as much as you know, the women's sport is growing, and I'm not going to get into because we we talked about it, and we will continue to talk about it, put pressure on it, of course. And we need a domestic league in Canada. That's neither here nor there. But the bigger story, of course, is are people watching? Do people care? Yeah, they do. They really, really do. And case in point, I mean, I can go into the PWHPA last year when it was announced Secret would be one of their main sponsors, and we were talking a seven-digit figure. And now it's just been announced that the National Women's Soccer League has signed this multi-year deal with Delta to be their official airline. I mean, Melissa, when you just see the progression of women's leagues and you see that investment is there, like it is possible. The sponsorship dollars are there. They can be spent on women's sport. When you see things like this, how encouraging is that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for, for the NWSL, it, it takes great leadership to bring in these corporate sponsorships yeah. and, and people that actually believe in the product and can sell this product. Because, I mean, it can sell itself, but you need to really, I mean, that's a massive deal for Delta to be on board now. And now that just sets the line, right? This is, this is where you need to be. Like, if you want to be a part of this this. Basically, it's blowing up NWSL. If you want to be a part of this, this is what you need to invest in. And I think that's the only way we can basically elevate the women's sport in our in North America, well, hopefully in this country as well. Um, but it, it needs to be treated as a professional entity. It needs to be treated as something that creates a lot of money and, and brings a lot of spectators in. And the more this happens, I mean, the more people want to play in it, the more people want to invest in it. It's just It just keeps the ball rolling, really. And just piggybacking off of you, Melissa, when you do have sponsorships like this with Delta, which is huge, I'm, I'm hoping that it comes out that Delta's like, you guys are all flying private. Everyone has their own Delta airline because it makes a massive difference. I don't think people understand the travel involved within the NWSL. It's extremely difficult. I mean, you're playing West Coast, East Coast with sometimes two connecting flights, missed flights. Everyone knows mm -hmm. how the travel is in America. It's extremely yeah. difficult. but you're setting the standards. And I think that's the biggest shift from when we played in the NWSL to now you're starting to see a lot of those teams kind of get weeded out, ownership get weeded out, because now you have teams like San Diego, LA, uh, Portland, even Seattle. Seattle finally, finally bringing their team out of Tacoma. I don't know why they played in Tacoma, but putting it at the Sounders Now Stadium. And I think that's so important. If you can invest, I mean, even KC, I mean, you have multi-millions of dollars going into a proper training ground only for the women's team, a proper playing facility only for the women's team. Race in Louisville, one of the best stadiums, I think, in the league. The grass pitch is phenomenal. So you're starting to see, again, those teams that didn't take it seriously get weeded out, more investment coming in, and more women investment coming in as well. I mean, you look at the two LA team or two California teams that just came in, and most of those are getting spearheaded by, you know, whether it's celebrities, former athletes, Serena Williams' daughter that's five years old and has more money than I'll ever have in my mm -hmm. bank account. But it's great to see that women are now investing in the NWSL um, and they're in a position to. I mean, us soccer players, we're probably not ever going to be soon hopefully we will one day to be able to invest in a soccer team but i'm hoping that's where it goes i mean the u.s can probably do that because of sponsorships like this but when you're bringing in big sponsorship more eyes are on you and it allows an opportunity to get paid more financially off the pitch because you're not making multi-millions of dollars on the pitch mm -hmm. yeah laura what do you when you make of it when you start to see that it's a lazy narrative, right? That, oh, they're the, the investment, you know, the investors, they're not out there. Mm, yeah, they are. Just, you got to know how to get them. <laughs> also a lazy argument that it's like cheaper to um, invest in women's sports than men's sports. Like, I mean, I think that that's probably something that people people were saying years ago, like women's sports is a, is a good investment. There are statistics that show that people will watch women's sports when they are on TV. Like 
what like I mean think about the the number of people what was it over six or seven million who tuned into the gold medal games between the women's soccer and the yeah. women's hockey this year or in yeah. the last six months like people will watch and and so I think a lot of people used to say oh well it's a cheaper it's a cheaper investment like go invest in women's sports and it's like no it's still significant and they're still going to demand you know top dollar but I think that this delta thing is amazing I also think yeah. that you know it's not just delta right it's Budweiser it's Mastercard it's Nike like they're they're really starting to see multiple sponsorships mm-hmm. and and that just goes to show that um you know this is a this is a product that is going to you know get these these companies mm-hmm. money like they're big companies and they're not interested in a product that is not going to benefit them i also think that one thing that we should mention about this uh, Delta partnership is that they're also going to, you know, work with the NWSL on, you know, empowerment programs and diversity and inclusion. And I think that, you know, the NWSL has done a good job in, in that sense of finding like-minded sponsors and making sure that they're bringing the right people into these conversations. And it sounds, at least at the outset of this deal, um, that Delta is one of them. And yes, hopefully that means that they all get to have much more comfier flights. I, and I know we're wrapping up, but I just have one thing to say as well. More money and more investment in the NWSL by these uh, by these organizations, whether it's Delta, Budweiser, you just named off a whole list. It also gets put into the TV side of things. So a little bit behind the scenes, most people that cover NWSL games fly themselves into Florida, pay for their hotel, pay for their airfare, pay for their food, and usually break even or don't make any money because the wages were anywhere from like 200 to $400 a game, 400 being the max that you can make. They've now pumped that up. Thank mm-hmm. God. Um, so obviously better broadcast uh, personalities can come in finally financially and be able to do it. And then more of the games going on the big network, the CBS um, uh, main channel, and then all the rest of them being on Paramount plus and Twitch. So that's also obviously great for the league as well. Sorry, I just had to throw that in there because I know a lot of people get like hammer on the NWSL broadcasters and I'm like, they literally are doing yeah. this because they love the game and want to promote it. And they're like, they're yeah. literally losing money being here. It's a trickle effect. It's an ecosystem that you have to create, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you invest in this, this benefits yeah. and then because that benefits, that benefit. Like, yeah, it's it's a, it's an ecosystem that um, I think the seeds have been planted and right now we're just doing the watering and we're watching a lot of it grow. Um, but, you know, the... <laughs> It's all about continuing to fertilize and grub control, and you know all that fun <laughs> stuff. As I use that analogy there, right? But grow, baby, grow. That's what we're seeing. Melissa, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Uh, best of luck with me. Uh, with everything that you're you're doing as well with the uh, the national team. Because I know you guys have. Oh my goodness, it's going to be a crazy year. You have some World Cup qualification that's coming mm-hmm. on up, and all and that. Congrats fun on stuff. your engagement. Oh. I wasn't going to say anything because I wasn't sure. I have to. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know if she wanted that to be private, but Kaylin, oh, a former okay. teammate, Sorry. said it. All right. <laughs> it, was so now we're... it was on Instagram, so I felt oh, like okay, it okay, was okay. on limit. Well, there you go. So congratulations on that. So you, you definitely got some nice planning to do for a big party. That's Kaylin Kyle, Melissa Tate, Credit Laura Armstrong. I'm Annie Petrillo. Thanks for tuning in to OneSoccer.ca.